So here's the thing with the end times is most often when Christians think end times, this is what immediately pops in our head. We think Antichrist, Mark of the Beast, uh, the Great Tribulation, you know, which nations are going to join together in a coalition to invade Israel and all of these type of things. And this is a very important and central part of the end time story. This is, as believers, Jesus expects us to sort of understand these things. He wants us to know the signs of the times. However... Just for uh, clarity's sake, I think it's important to emphasize that that's not the primary focus. Okay, so the, Jesus used the analogy. He referred to all of the events that would precede his coming. He used the analogy of birth pains. So husbands, imagine if, you're, <clears throat> if you and your wife are having your first child and you come home from work and your wife's like, honey... All day long, you know, the, the due date is, is coming up. It's, it's in February. And I've just been thinking all day about the birth pains. And it's like, wait a minute. What? You do realize that it's not primarily about the birth pains, right? And they're like, no, I mean, I'm just thinking, oh, it's going to really hurt. And uh, your yeah, husband's like, okay, honey, I think we need to go get some Prozac or something. You know what I'm saying? Like something's a little bit off here. Now, for clarity, again, if you're a good husband, you're going to go to the Lamaze classes and you're going to, you know, learn how to breathe and, and do all the different things. I mean, there's, you know, uh, that's part of it. But that's not the main focus. The main focus is that there's a baby coming. And then I just, my oldest daughter just turned 20. So also, by the way, there's a lot that happens after the baby. There's a lot of planning that goes into this whole thing. But there is something that's coming, and as believers, our primary focus is not the Antichrist, the mark of the beast. Again, he wants us to understand those things. What do the scriptures say about those things? And I can talk about those things all day, uh, but that's not the primary focus today. But our primary focus is the return of Jesus, the establishment of his kingdom, and this is our inheritance. We're Christians, right? Why are we here? What are, what are we here for this morning? We're here to worship Jesus, but it's ultimately because we gather together on a regular basis to encourage one another. Why? Because we share a common future and a common hope. Look, I gave up drugs for a reason. It's because I exchanged it for something much better, right? We forsake the pleasures of this world because we have a common future inheritance. And so we gather together to encourage one another concerning that which we are laying down our lives and embracing the cross for every day because that's what we're looking forward to, right? And then we leave, we go out, and the world does everything it can to discourage us and say that stuff is just a bunch of nonsense, and so we gather together on a regular basis to remind ourselves that, look, how many, how many of you are like me? I know the world's changed. It used to be um, the Pink Floyd song, you know, every day the paper boy brings more. You know, here comes little Jeffy on his huffy with bad news. But now, coming down the driveway, now it goes like this. You wake up in the morning, you open your laptop, and you go, ugh. Right? I mean, how many people, like, are walking around with a groan every day? How many people just feel like, ugh, right? There's, like, a lot of bad news. There's, like, a lot of really discouraging things in the world, in the nation, on the news. It's just like, I mean, if you, like, even approach social media, it's just, it's depressing. But things are not always going to be this way. We're not always going to continue to get old and sick. There's not always going to be bad news. There is a completely new system coming. And everything out there, the entire system is structured to discourage us. Right? Amen. There's a very new world coming. So the purpose of gathering together is to gather together and encourage one another. And so it's important that we understand the nature of inheritance, the, the nature of the things that are coming. And listen, eschatology is confusing. There are a lot of voices and messages within the church that can be pretty confusing. You have some in the church that say, no, God is done with Israel. You know, we're the new Israel. And you have others that say, no, God's not done with Israel. He's going to fulfill all of his good promises to Israel. Some people say, Jesus is coming back to literally rule and reign on the earth. Others say, no, someday when we die, we become ghosts forever in the clouds. You go, that's a pretty different story. 
What is it that we're laying down our lives for? I want some clarity here. And so I think one of the best ways to do that, one of the best ways that I like to do that, is just to step back and review the big story. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. I just want to look at a whole bunch of scripture, and I just want to look at the story of Jesus. Because as we do that, as we trace this, this sort of thread that is that goes all the way through the scriptures, we look at some of these basic threads, these common themes, and we see how they're interwoven. We see the larger story that the Bible is telling us about Jesus, and then that settles some of these, these controversies and some of these questions. So the first verse is Genesis 3, verse 15. This is sometimes called by theologians the Proto-Evangelion, the, the first gospel. This is the first time in the Bible, that the gospel is sort of introduced, the good news is introduced. So uh, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, the fall has happened, and as soon as corruption has entered the system, the Lord immediately introduces the solution. And it's very vague, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, nebulous, it's not real clear, but he just says this, he says to the serpent, he says, listen serpent, you know, you succeeded in deceiving and leading uh, Adam and Eve astray, he says, but I'm going to put enmity, conflict between you and the woman and between your seed, your offspring and her seed. And it's singular. So it's a singular seed. And then it says, and he is going to crush your head. Who's the he? It's mysterious. It's vague. But whoever he is, the serpent's like, I don't think I like the sound of this. He's going to crush your head. You're going to bruise. You're going to merely strike at his heel. You're going to get a little in yourself. But then he is going to crush your head. This is the introduction. As soon as sin and death and corruption enter the system, the Lord says, by the way, I have a solution. We don't know who he is, but it's he. That's all we know so far. Okay, then we skip forward. We're following this thread through the scriptures. We're still in Torah. We're still in the books of Moses. We're still back in the first few books. And this is the story of Balaam and Balak. Okay? Balak was the king of the Moabites. This was a kingdom to the east of Israel in roughly modern-day Jordan, southern, central, modern-day Jordan. And the Israelites were now coming up out of the desert, out of Egypt, coming up from what would be the area today of northwest Saudi Arabia. They're coming up into Jordan, and they're encroaching upon Moabite territory. So Balak was all upset. He's like, who are all these people coming into my land? So he hires this guy named Balaam to curse the Hebrews. And Balaam, he's kind of this strange character because he's a prophet, but yet he was corrupt, and, you know, it's kind of an interesting case study. But Balaam goes, hey, I'm only going to speak what the Holy Spirit speaks to me. What God speaks, I'll speak. You can pay me, I'll take the money, but I'm only going to speak what the Holy Spirit speaks. So they're up on this high mountain, and they're looking down at the Hebrews who are encamped uh, down in this vast plain below. And the Spirit of the Lord comes on Balaam, and he begins to prophesy concerning the Hebrews. And he says this, Numbers 24, 17 through 19. He says, I see him. There he is. Who is it? It's vague. It's the him. All we know is it's the one that's going to crush the head of Satan. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. So it's, it's, it's distant, but I see him. And then he says, a star shall come up out of Jacob. Jacob is another name, a synonym for the, he for the Hebrews. That was the other name of Jacob was Israel. And then he says, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So now the Lord begins to expand upon this original deposit of the crushing one, and he says he is going to be a ruler that's going to come up out of Israel. And what is this ruler going to do? You know, of all the things early on that the Lord could have talked about, he's going to heal the sick, he's going to die for the sins, of, you know, all the different things that Jesus would do, he emphasizes this, he will crush the foreheads of Moab. This is the crushing one. Remember back in Genesis 3.15, the one that's going to crush the head of Satan? Now the Lord starts naming names. And he goes, you guys who are hostile to my people, you who harbor this everlasting hatred of my people and my plan, one who is coming, he's going to be a ruler of Israel and he's going to crush the heads of Moab. Now for clarity, this is not a racial issue. The Lord doesn't hate Moabites. 
He hates those who allow their hearts to be containers of hatred. The Lord has a plan to redeem all of creation, to end this current wicked system. And when people allow themselves to be conduits of satanic hatred, the Lord says, I hate that. Okay, it's not about, it's not about the race, although sometimes the, the language of the prophets can almost sound that way and people can twist the scriptures to their own uh, to distort them. So it says, he shall crush the foreheads of Moab, break down all the sons of Sheph, this is what we do, by the way, good students of the Old Testament. We go, Moab, Chef, Edom, I don't know, moving on, do, 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 you know. Like, we don't stop to go, what is it talking about here? Chef is basically interpreted variously as like the sons of tumult or the sons of violence. Some translations say the sons of the East. But it was those that had this, this violence, this hatred. Edom, which was a sister or brother kingdom to Moab, shall be dispossessed. Seir, which was the prominent mountain in Edom, and, which, and then it says, the Lord says, his enemies shall be dispossessed. So anyway, here's the point, is we have the deposit, the introduction. Someone who is coming is going to crush the head of Satan. Now we know that the crushing one is going to be a ruler of Israel. And in the right time, in the fullness of time, at the appointed time, he is going to crush the enemies of God's people. This is part of the prophecy. Where's the next deposit? We get to 2 Samuel. This is what is called the Davidic covenant. This is where the Lord makes a promise to King David, and he's expanding upon some previous promises that he had made to Abraham. He goes, I'm going to give you guys this land, this piece of property. So now he says to King David in chapter 7, verses 11 through 16, he says, The Lord declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, then I will raise up your seed, your descendant, your offspring after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. Some people say, well, that's Solomon. No, this is much more than just Solomon. Why? Because it says, he will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. There is a kingdom coming. Now we know that it's not just the crushing one who's going to crush the head of Satan. It's not just a ruler of Israel. He's going to come from the tribe of Judah, from the offspring of David. He's going to be the son of David. Now the Lord begins to get more specific, and these threads begin to be interwoven. And then the story continues throughout the scriptures. The Lord is telling a very simple, clear story, but we can track with it. Your house, David, and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Psalm 110, verses 1 through 2, and then skipping forward to 5 through 6, it's a short psalm. This is one of the classic, most classic messianic psalms, one of the most important messianic psalms. Jesus himself actually quoted it to the scribes and the Pharisees um, and applied it to himself. Now, this, the funny thing about this is, you know, you come into church and, you know, out there in the entrance hallway, there'll be a picture of Jesus, and he's always sort of this slightly glowing, long-haired Caucasian hippie, and he's, he's kind of got this sheep over his shoulders, and he's like, hey, guys, what's going on? And the sheep's like, I'm with Jesus. It's cool. And that's a, that's a facet of, you know, the shepherd who leads me. I mean, that's a facet of who Jesus is. I don't mean the hippie part, but, you know, he, he is the, the shepherd. But there's another facet of Jesus that you never see the painting in the, in the entrance hallway of the church, and that's Psalm 110. The Lord says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. What does that mean? Until your enemies are crushed under your feet. It's not just like they become an ottoman. It's not like, hey, like, hey, kneel right here, put your feet. No, it's they are crushed under your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter, your rod of authority from Zion. Now the ruler, the son of David, is going to rule on the throne of his father David, which is where, it's a very specific geographic location, you can go there today, it's called Jerusalem. Zion, that is the actual city that God has chosen from where his son will rule over the earth from Zion. That's the spot that the Lord will establish the scepter of the son of David saying rule in the midst of or over your enemies. Now get this, the Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. 
when Jesus comes back, or I just like to put this in very common language, the Bible says the day is coming when a Jewish man is coming back to engage in a very violent and hostile takeover of the entire earth. I imagine I could be completely wrong that he's about three inches taller than me. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea how tall he was. I just assume he's taller than I am. He will engage in a hostile takeover of the earth. It says he will crush kings on the day of his wrath. Think of this. Jesus is coming back to kill unrighteous, self-serving, corrupt politicians and dictators. This is not just pie in the sky. This is reality. As real as this moment right now is real, as real as you can hear my voice, in our bodies, with eyeballs, in their sockets, not these bodies because it's going to be different, but yet there's a correlation. The Bible says that in the resurrection we will have glorified, resurrected, eternal bodies. I like to emphasize that, guys. After we die, we still get to eat <laughs> and smell. Not, we won't smell anymore, <laughs> if that makes sense. Something's wrong with my nose. It smells. Waiting for the laughter on that one. Get it? <laughs> we get to experience, because God created us to have bodies, because in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth, and it was all good, right? So in our flesh, in our glorified, resurrected bodies, we will see the king on his throne. That day is coming. That day is real. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead, crushing the rulers of the whole earth. Look, guys, that's uncomfortable. It's not part of the gospel story that's talked about frequently, but it is a very common theme throughout the good news, throughout the good news of the scriptures. There is something in us that burns for justice, that yearns for justice. How many people, I'll, I'll do it, how many people feel as though the world is fundamentally unjust and corrupt? We live in a very unjust system. Now look, the Bible says hate the world. It doesn't, I, when I first got saved, I didn't understand that. I go, but I like the trees. It's not about hating the planet. It's about hating the system. The system is currently governed by wickedness, by wicked men and by wicked principalities. And there is one coming back who is going to crush the wickedness and he's going to replace the unrighteous leadership with humble servant leadership. That's good news. We were created to yearn for this. Why do we get excited about it? Because we were made, to, we were made for this. Why do we get excited when I say we get to eat? Because we were made to have bodies. We were made to have bodies, just not bodies with aging, corruption, and all of these things. Isaiah 9, verse 6 through 7, another classic messianic prophecy. We talk about it usually around Christmas. For unto us a child is born, a, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. His government will increase. And then it says, and on the throne of his father David and over his kingdom to establish it. What will be the essence of the kingdom that's coming? To uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. That day is coming, that kingdom is coming. The zeal, the passion, the burning zeal of the Father heart of God will accomplish this. It's not just us that are burning. It's not, we're not the only ones who are groaning. Trust me, guys, there is, there's more corruption in the earth today. There's more, there are more slaves in the earth right now than in any time in human history. You think God's heart is not yearning for the day of the Lord? He wants it. He's burning for it much more than we are. You know, sometimes there can be sort of a morbid approach to the end times. I joked, you know, clapping about the end times. But guys, when we're clapping, it's not because we're clapping for plagues and pestilences. We're not clapping for the birth pains. We're clapping for the birth. We're clapping for the kingdom that's coming. We're clapping because we're excited about the end of this current system of wickedness. We're clapping because we're, we're looking forward to the end of sickness, the end of death, the end of struggling with sin, sugar addiction, whatever it might be. <laughs> 
And then you have Christians especially seminarians that just got out of seminary. And they're like, Joel, that's all good and fine. But that's all in the Old Testament. You see, the apostles came along and they reimagined. They, they reinterpreted all of those things and they reinterpreted them spiritually. When it's talking about a kingdom, it's talking about the blessings that we have in Christ now. This is it. And I go, if this is it, guys, then... I'm really let down. Don't get me wrong, but if this is all there is, if this is the fullness of what Jesus died for, I might just try something else. I mean, if I can just be frank with you. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm happy to not be a drug addict anymore or not to be this or that, but if this is it, then I'm really, I'm failing. I'm failing at this Christian thing because I'm still struggling. I'm still tired. I'm still sad. All of these things. However, if there's a kingdom coming, if the scriptures are true that there is glory after suffering, then I have something that I'm looking forward to, that I'm eagerly expecting and eagerly awaiting. But here's the thing, guys. The New Testament does not reinterpret all of these things spiritually. It does not reimagine them. In fact, the New Testament picks up on all of the Old Testament promises. It reiterates them. It expands upon them. It trumpets them. It celebrates them. But it doesn't change any of them. All of God's promises are still yes and amen. So we get to Luke chapter 1 verses 30 through 33, and here you have a little Mary, little Miriam, little Jewish girl. I don't know how old she was, and she was very devout. She was zealous. She grew up in the synagogue. She knew the scriptures. She knew all of the scriptures that we just read. She had heard them read. She had them memorized in her heart, and all of a sudden, this angel shows up. His name is Gabriel, and Gabriel says to little Mary, he says, Mary, don't be afraid. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive. Wait, what? You will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son, right? Because she's going, hold on. You know, this is the first kind of just shock that she receives. But I am an Alma. I am a virgin. How can such be? And you shall name his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. Okay, Muslims, he is not just a prophet. He is the son of the Most High. Let's be very clear. The, the, the angel from heaven declared, this is the son of the Most High. Now get this. The angel says, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Okay, so little Mary knew the scriptures. The angel just declares to her, guess what? First of all, Brace yourself, you're going to be pregnant, even though you're a virgin. Okay, that's just the... And then he goes, but that's not it. And then he goes, and here's who he's going to be. Now, again, Mary knew the scripture. So the first thing she goes, she goes, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me just first, I'm still getting over the whole I'm going to be pregnant thing. And then she goes, and now you're telling me that I am going to be the mother of the one who's going to sit on the throne of my father, David. And he goes, yeah, that's the one. She goes, so you're saying the one back there in Isaiah 9. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called everlasting father, prince of peace. Yeah, Mary, you're going to be his mother. She's going, all right, wait, hold on. I'm still processing this. So you're saying all the way back when you swore to my father David that he would have a son. The same one that Isaiah, yeah, that's the one. Okay, so back when Balaam was talking to Balak, and he said, one who's going to come and he's going to crush the enemies of God and the enemies of the people of God. Yeah, that's the one. She goes, so what you're saying is all the way back there in Genesis 15, at the beginning of the fall, when the Lord showed up and said to the serpent, one who is coming who is going to crush your head, Satan. Gabriel's like, you're going to be his mother. I mean, think about this. Mary, I guarantee you Mary understood what the angel was saying. She was not Old Testament illiterate. And she's piecing this together and going, you're kidding me. Like, what just happened? I just saw an angel with my eyes, and he told me that I'm going to be the mother of the one that's going to put an end to Satan and sin, corruption and death and sickness and all of these things. I'm going to be his mother. 
I mean, you know, like that actually happened to a real little girl. This is not just Sunday school stories. That actually happened to a real person. And then she went home and she treasured these things up in her heart. <clears throat> Jesus is presently, what is he presently doing right now at this moment? What is he doing? He is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He's interceding, right? We know that. But is that all there is or is there more to the story? Okay, so he is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. But here in Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus tells the rest of the story. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that you have followed me, speaking to his disciples. He says, in the regeneration. That's a word referring to the age of the resurrection, the age of the restoration, the age of the renewal of all things. Behold, I make all things new. It's like a glorified Garden of Eden combined with a glorified kingdom of David or Solomon. Mix them together, pour a whole bunch of glory syrup all over it, and you're just beginning to get a picture of the age to come. It's on the earth. It's like Garden of Eden, but it's way better. It's like the kingdom of David, but it's way better. And Jesus calls it the regeneration. In the regeneration, when the Son of Man will come back and sit on his glorious throne. Some translations say on his throne of glory. So here's the thing. Jesus has not yet come back because we're not in the regeneration. We're not in the renewal yet. This is most certainly not all there is. He's coming back, and then he says to his disciples, you guys are going to sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, that's impossible, Joel, because God is done with Israel. Jesus made it very clear. This is very Jewish language. The disciples will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. But the point is this. Jesus is not yet sitting on his glorious throne. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he is waiting to come back to sit on the restored throne of his father David to fulfill that which all the prophets declared. Uh, in Matthew 25, this is the end of the Olivet Discourse. Jesus again reiterated the same point. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of the angels with him, that hasn't happened yet. He has not come back in all of his glory with all of his angels. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. I'm yearning for that day. I'm longing for that day. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. This is essentially the, the uh, judgment. The scriptures say there is a day that's been appointed when a man, that's Jesus, will come back and he will judge the living and the dead and he will judge the nations. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you from before the foundation of the very world. And then to the, to the goats, to those that are on his left, he says, um, away, away from me, into, the, into essentially the everlasting fire. Okay, so this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the tread meets the road. You who have been blessed of my Father, come inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you. But to those on his left, away from me. I never knew you. And, he, and, and so it's either eternal bliss, eternal blessing, or into the lake of destruction, into the lake of fire. I mean, this is, this is the day of judgment. Skip forward to the second to the last slide. It's Hebrews 10. Again, Jesus is currently sitting at the right hand of the Father. Whenever I say, what is Jesus doing right now? Everyone usually says he's interceding. That's true. He is making intercession for us. Satan is the one that stands there before the throne, accusing the brethren day and night, lashing out, making accusations, most of which are true. And, uh, but just reminding, you know, this is how they're falling short. This is what they're doing wrong. And Jesus is interceding, but he is also doing something else. Hebrews 10, 12 through 13 says this. It says, he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he sat down at the right hand of God. And from that time forward, it says that he has been waiting. Waiting. Waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Again, the heart of the Father, the heart of Jesus, 
is yearning and burning and groaning to put an end to the sighing and the groaning that we have. I sometimes, uh, you know, as I alluded to, I sometimes I, I wrestle with sadness. It's not depression, but I wrestle with sadness. And I, it used to sort of be like, in church, it used to be like sometimes the message that I would get is almost like, well, hey, brother, you know, like the joy of the Lord is your strength. Like, just get over it sort of thing. And I was like, well, yeah, yeah, I get that. But by the same token, Romans 8 says that all of creation right now is groaning. It says the Holy Spirit in us is groaning. I guarantee you the fact that the Father's heart is groaning because things are not the way they're supposed to be. Things are broken. When your kids are sick, it bothers you. When your kids are struggling, it bothers you. And suddenly I realized, you know something? There's a groan in me, there's a groan in all of us that we're not supposed to silence. The cry of the early church, it was not just hallelujah, it was maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. They were in touch with the groan. They were in touch with the cry that all of creation feels, yearning for that day. And if you have sadness because of the current circumstances of the world, again, that's different than depression. But if you have that groan, that's okay. God himself feels that groan. And it says that Jesus right now feels the groan. He is waiting he is waiting, he's burning to come back to where he can crush his enemies like grapes under his feet. The final passage I want to look at is Revelation. So now we began all the way back in Gen at the beginning. We began in Genesis. We come full circle all the way to the end of the Bible. Again, we could have looked at dozens of other verses, but, you know, we kind of follow that thread. Who is Jesus? He's the crushing one. He's the king of Israel. He's the one that's going to crush Satan. He's the one that was born through Mary. He's the one that the apostles declared. He's the one that they laid down their lives for. He's coming back in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. This is the one verse that almost all Christians know with regard to the return of Jesus. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven are with him, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. They're following him on white horses. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, the corrupt, wicked nations, the dictators throughout the earth, the corrupt politicians that are called to be servant leaders, but instead they, they put themselves in power for their own wealth, their own glory, and they don't serve the people. He's coming back to strike them down. He will tread the winepress of the fury, the passion of the wrath of God Almighty. He will crush his enemies and Satan and our sin nature like grapes. He will stomp them like grapes. He will put an end to this current system. That day is coming. That day is real. Amen? I want to just take a minute for ministry time. The day is coming when Jesus is coming back, as we said, to judge the living and the dead. I, uh, I have this picture in my head, I think we can all relate to it, where, you know, you have, and I think the Lord actually gives us these as pictures. Remember the whole thing with Dolly Madison, the website where couples could sign up to have affairs and then... It was um, a couple prominent, uh, like uh, the Duggar's son, I mean, you know, Lord have mercy, but a very prominent uh, Christian figure who was um, part of the American Family Council. You know, his info was there and all sorts of other people. I think there were even some pastors. There were some people that committed suicide, this sort of thing. Um, that little event is kind of like a little picture of the Day of Judgment. The scriptures say that the deeds done in darkness will be shouted from the rooftops. Okay, so the day is coming when Jesus is going to hack Google. And the internet histories and thought histories and everything of everyone is going to be shouted from the rooftops. And there's not a single one of us that can stand before him on that day. No one can stand apart from the blood of Jesus. Apart from being 
cleansed and washed by the mercy of God and the blood of the Lamb, no one can stand before the great and terrible day of the Lord. But that day is coming, and we will give an account for the deeds done in this body, whether good or bad. Now, I know that most in the room are Christians. At some point in your life, you've committed your life to Jesus. You've repented of your sins, and you've said yes. But I'm sure there are some that haven't, and there are some that are wandering. There are some that are far from God right now. I want everyone to bow your heads. If you know that at this moment in your life you need the Lord's mercy. And again, that's all of us. But if, it's, if this is touching you, you say, Lord, I want to enjoy the fruits and the blessings of the kingdom to come. I want to partake of that which you provided and you purchased for me. But I know that my sin has wrapped its tentacles around me and I need your mercy and I need freedom. I want you to raise your hand right now and we're going to pray for you. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never repented of your sins, if that's something you've never put a stake in the ground, then I want you to cast fear aside and say, Lord, I don't want to inherit the lake of fire. I want to inherit that which you created me for. And I want you to raise your hand. If you're a Christian that's just hungry for this and excited and you go, man, this just made me come alive. I want to live for the age to come. I want to live for the good things that you provided for me. I want to run with abandon. I want to run with zeal. I want to feel the passion, God, that you have for purity in my life and for zeal in my life. Then I want you to raise your hand. So, Father, I ask that you would touch hungry hearts, hearts that say yes throughout the room. You look, you go throughout the earth looking to and fro for those that you can use, vessels. Lord, we ask that by your spirit you would come right now and that you would extend mercy and grace to everyone in the room. Let this house, let this body become a shining light in the community, that we would be a people who live for the age to come, that we would have the joy of the kingdom to come in our eyes and it would be contagious and we would be zealous and hungry and excited to proclaim this good news to those around us. Help this people, help this house to become an invitational house, a house that invites those on the highways and the byways to come, to bid them to come to the wedding feast. We commit ourselves to you for these purposes. We say, yes, use us, Lord. We thank you for all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.